to be sure during this video course that we're talking about the same things, let's clarify exactly what terms we're using to describe what. I have a question for you. Would you say that you could correctly name all the parts and pieces of the dorsal apparatus? Well, when we ask this question in a live webinar, 100% of therapists said no, they could not do this. And I too would have said that many years ago, even though I thought I understood this anatomy. The extensor digitorum communis we know well as it approaches the metacarpal phalangeal joint. We call it the EDC. There's really no clarification needed there. But as it approaches the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the fibrous bands that encircle the MP joint are called sagittal bands, or if you will, sagittal band fibers. Each metacarpal phalangeal joint has a sagittal band that goes all the way around and this centralizes the extensor digitorum communis. When the extensor digitorum communis has moved beyond the sagittal band and it is now the central portion of the dorsal apparatus, the term central slip is appropriate. This term central slip is actually, however, commonly used to describe the central slip insertion. But the central slip insertion is exactly that. It is an insertion. And therefore, during this presentation, we will, make, we will create a distinct separation between central slip, and when we're using that term, we're, we are describing this central portion here. And when we say insertion, we are indeed describing the insertion of the dorsal apparatus just distal to the proximal interphalangeal joint into the middle phalanx. The dorsal apparatus coalesces and terminates in the terminal tendon insertion. All of these fibers come together to create one insertion into the dorsal aspect of the distal phalanx. When we look at the dorsal apparatus, we assume that there is a terrific amount of power that's gathering up to insert at the terminal tendon insertion. But indeed, as we'll look at later, there are multiple insertions of the dorsal apparatus, limiting the excursion of the system both proximally and distally, and also limiting the amount of power that's being driven to the terminal tendon insertion. Proximally on the dorsal apparatus, there are two groups of fibers that are relatively distinct and have specific functions. The transverse fibers, which go straight across proximally, and receive the insertion of the interosseous muscles are the, the fibers that are responsible for metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion. You can see that they are distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. In extension, they overlap the sagittal band somewhat. In flexion, they move further distally. On a cadaver, actually, when you're looking down on an extended finger, it's almost impossible to identify fibers as being part of the sagittal band versus the transverse fibers. So it appears that they blend together when in fact they are overlapping. The oblique fibers actually make up the majority of the proximal aspect of the dorsal apparatus and they coalesce to insert distal to the proximal interphalangeal joint at the central slip insertion. The oblique fibers are indeed primarily responsible for PIP joint extension, but they get some help from the extensor digitorum communis power, and we also need to consider that if this portion of the dorsal apparatus is moving proximally, 
The remainder of the dorsal apparatus also has to have some tension applied to it by virtue of that proximal tension. So it's never just the oblique fibers that are working alone. The lateral bands. Lateral bands are nothing more than the thickened edge of the dorsal apparatus. The dorsal apparatus is, as we know, a, a rather thin fiber, group of fibers. But on the edge of this is a thickened area. I like to think of an analogy of a, a tent or a tarpaulin that we have um, put put up in order to uh, cover the, us as we have a picnic in the sun. Imagine if there's a rope along the edge of this tarpaulin and we pull on the rope. Pulling on that rope will tension the entire surface area. Therefore, the lateral bands, even though they are on the edge, will affect movement in the entire dorsal apparatus. The lateral bands are not distinct, separate tendons that move independently. They are the edge, and therefore when they move, the entire dorsal apparatus moves with them. The conjoined lateral bands have many different names, and in reading particularly older literature, it can be very confusing what specific part of the anatomy is being referred to. The conjoined lateral bands are yet another example of how all of these fiber layers are interconnected. As you can see, one group of fibers goes out to the lateral band and another group comes in from the lateral band. This, in addition to all the other factors, really solidifies the concept that everything moves in concert. Here we see that the extensor digitorum communis power as we pull on this would be transferred via the conjoined lateral band out to the lateral band, therefore transmitting power to the terminal tendon insertion. The converse is true and that is that the conjoined lateral bands here coming from the lateral bands join with these oblique fibers because they're all running obliquely and that indeed creates a transfer of power from the lateral bands to the central slip insertion. Nothing can move very far without the adjacent structure going along at least for the ride. Now as we look at the anatomy, would you be able to identify each of the three retinactor structures of the dorsal apparatus? Would it be clear exactly where these start and stop? Retinacular structures can also be called retaining structures. And as we know from the dorsal retinaculum and the pulleys on the finger, these are very tenacious, thick, dense tissue that are unyielding and therefore do not stretch. They also are not active. They're not connected to any source of power. Their goal is to retain or keep in place the tendinous structures. And in the dorsal apparatus, we also see that there is a secondary function of linking joint movement. The first retinacular structure is the transverse retinacular ligament. Now, we think of a ligament traditionally as going from bone to bone, crossing over a joint, and limiting joint movement. But the use of the term ligament in this application does not uh, identify that type of function across a joint. Instead, the transverse retinacular ligament arises from the volar plate and the flexor tendon sheath. It goes completely around the finger, just ever so distally to the PIP joint, and its purpose is to retain the dorsal apparatus. Specifically, in going all the way around, it limits the amount of dorsal movement 
of the lateral bands. In other words, the lateral bands cannot move up dorsally away from their normal position. The triangular ligament indeed also does not connect bone, but rather it connects tendon. It's a group of fibers distal to the PIP joint that connect both lateral bands as they move toward the terminal tendon insertion. This triangular ligament is distal to the transverse retinacular ligament, but there are fibers that overlap one another. This has the opposite function of the transverse retinacular ligament in that it limits volar movement of the lateral bands rather than dorsal movement. During normal finger flexion, the lateral bands move laterally and volarly. Let me repeat that. During normal finger flexion, they move somewhat laterally and volarly. To prevent excessive volar movement, that lateral movement would tend to want to bring these two tendons apart during flexion, and the triangular ligament prevents that. So the triangular ligament retains the relationship of the lateral band just prior to their insertion. The oblique retinacular ligament is unique because it does cross joints and therefore it has the potential to affect joint movement. Now remember that's not an active ability but it's a passive ability. So if the oblique retinacular ligament is limited it's adherent um, and it's unable to move through its normal movement, that then can limit the amount of joint motion at one joint or the other. The oblique retinacular ligament arises also from the volar plate and the flexor tendon sheath and it runs obliquely on both sides of the finger, coming dorsally to blend with and to become part of the terminal tendon insertion. That means if the terminal tendon insertion is a volts, such as in a mallet finger, that also the oblique, oblique retinacular ligament is also a volts. The oblique retinacular ligament is often called the ORL or Langmuir's ligament. Its purpose is to coordinate the interphalangeal joint movement, although as we'll discuss in another video course, there's some controversy about its exact role. And because it exists on both sides uh, of each finger, the lateral um, presence provides some stability to motion during flexion and extension.